a hearty welcome to you. We're, we're coming to you from uh, many different states, and I'm sure you're all coming from many different states and, and countries. Um, we appreciate that you've joined us. If you're here, you're one of the many people who've signed up for activating the physical store, the lineup of sessions today. And among the one o'clock breakout sessions, you have the good sense to select our panel, which is the physical store, new realities and new opportunities. So welcome. Um, Amanda, let's click to the next. Um, our presentation today has been jointly developed by the teams at Chase Design and at Simpactful. And I'll briefly just introduce uh, what our companies are about, and then we'll get into the, uh, the presentation. Chase Design is a human-centered retail design firm. We have a focus on translating how and why shoppers buy to develop more persuasive retail experiences. That's at the category, department, or even full store level. And we do that to deliver incremental revenues at full price. When I say full price, I mean trade. This has nothing to do with trade promotion. This is reimagining the in store shopping experience uh, to drive incremental revenues. Now, Simpactful, our partner today, is a leading retail consultancy focused on helping CPGs and retailers to uncover winning solutions, driven by a team of former retail industry executives with blue chip experience, insight, and connections. And together, we've uh, put together our, our, our brains and experience to bring in the presentation today. And I'd like to introduce the team, if I may. Amanda, we'll go to the next, thanks. So I'm your MC, I'm Peter Clodier. I'm Growth and Commercial Strategy Lead at Chase. And I bring a fair number of decades of experience in leading retail experience design for leading brands, <coughs> like uh, for brands and retailers alike. Um, and as you can see, I'm not a millennial and I've been doing this for a while. Um, Joe Lampertius is president of Chase Design. He's led the development of winning retail design solutions for CPGs that would include Procter & Gamble, Coke, Kraft Heinz, and others and also with retail partners that include the who's who of um, large retail players, Walmart, Target, Kroger, uh, and, and many, many more. So he came up in the business via traditional brand management roles at leading beer and apparel brand companies. Next, Jack Fuller, he's senior partner with Simpactful Consulting. He helps CPG companies and retailers grow sales through their superior retail execution. He keeps clients a step ahead of the transformation happening in brick and mortar with a data-led store back approach to meeting shoppers' needs. Uh, it's certainly worth mentioning, Jack previously spent 35 years at Procter & Gamble in retail strategy, sales management, and operations leadership positions. Yes, he's the smartest guy in the room, so please ask him a lot of questions. Um, Jill McIntosh is a senior consultant with Simpactful, and she brings a depth of insight into clients uh, in the areas of store merchandising, e-commerce, and organizational development, same with you. She's held leadership uh, positions at Kroger, including VP Natural Foods Merchandising, and she's currently on the board of directors for, I think, no fewer than three companies that are focused on emerging consumer brands, a real passion point for Joe. And just off stage is Amanda Ernst. She's our marketing manager with Chase Design. She'll be managing our on-screen slides today, um, and I'm assuming all will go well, so um, my thanks to her uh, in advance. Now, before we get into the presentation today, we'd love to know, now that we've introduced ourselves, um, who we're talking to. Now that would take a long, long time for each of you to introduce yourselves, but we're just gonna do a quick poll and allow you to bucket yourself into one of three three areas. Amanda, why don't you give that a shot? So right next to chat, there's a button called polls, and then just self-identify yourself. I believe the choices are something like marketer, retailer, or solution provider. It's a pretty three big buckets. Yep, and so we have uh, there's about 55 votes in already. So we'll do a little elevator music in the background while you complete this. <laughs> We've got about 17% manufacturer, 32% retailer, 50% solution providers is what's coming up. All right. Up. Sounds good. Well, I hope the solution providers will learn something from today. <clears throat> um, all right. Let's get going. So this is all about new realities and new opportunities. And to us, the challenge racing, uh, facing the retail industry today is, is stark. The pandemic that we're all living in um, has encouraged the kind of, I'll call it a technological arms race, to kind of to find faster, better, easier ways to streamline or, or even avoid in-person shopping altogether. And so we're at a time where buying goods means consumers no, re no longer really have to actually step inside of a store to shop. The physical stores risk becoming near points of fulfillment, differentiated only by level of convenience. That's scary, we think. 
But the opportunity is to do more than simply provide the convenience that shoppers need, while also delivering the inspiration, discovery, and delight that shoppers want. Let's go to the next slide, please. In other words, what we're really asking is, is, are these things mutually exclusive? Can stores deliver the ease and convenience people need in their buying transactions, while also delivering the inspiration and delight that people want in their shopping experience? And when we're done with this, hopefully you'll have a point of view on that if you don't already. Let's go to the next slide. So it would be easy to think that e-commerce and click and collect buying solutions are where all the attention should be focused. The pande pandemic has accelerated adoption of every digitally enabled buying channel where in-store sales, as you can see, have been in decline. Let's advance. Yet shopping in physical stores still dominates, even in this pandemic. Just under, uh, back up one. Thank you. Just under 90% of all purchases happened in a physical store in the survey that was done, I believe, in December of, of 2020. Go ahead. And next year, there's going to be more shopping at brick and mortar stores. Again, this, this is a survey. This also in December of 2020. 69%, nearly 7 out of 10, plan to shop in more in 2021. Plan to shop in stores less. So this focus on the, the physical stores is going to, if anything, increase. Next slide, please. Target's a great example of what happened at the mainstream level. All resulting from, frankly, Brian Cornell's investment um, in the Target stores. So you can see, and you've all seen this if you're paying attention to the same newsletters that we all are. Target's revenues, total revenues are up 21%. Their digital revenues, obviously, a heck of a lot more than that. But in a time when we think of, of store traffic going down, it's actually on an increase, certainly, at Target. Let's go to the next slide. And that's because for Target, they have made a very purposeful decision to turn the store into a total commerce hub. So the majority of their sales are in store. We know that's up by about 5%. And 80% of all Target.com purchases are picked up at store. That's in-store or drive-up. 20% of their online purchases are delivered via uh, shipped, which Target owns. So they've literally looked, and they're shipped from the store uh, uh, via shipped. So this, the store itself has truly become a total commerce hub. Now, let's listen to Brian Cornell in this video as he talks about how Target is the role the of their stores. stores. Now, our Target stores really serve one role. It was a place you can shop. Today, they're at the very center of our strategy, both from a physical and a digital standpoint. We want to make sure when you're in our store, it is a great in-store experience. And we're investing in hours, in our team, labor, and wages to make sure we provide a great experience. Our stores are at the center of our digital growth. They're fulfilling the majority of our orders, whether it's order pickup or drive up. It's where we fulfill most of those orders in local neighborhoods. So the stores are centered to everything we're doing at Target. Next slide, please. So as Brian Cornell so eloquently put it, our stores are at the very center of everything we're doing at Target. I can't think of a better reason to spend some time talking about how brands and retailers are making the most of a physical store experience. So with that as our background, let's jump right in. We're gonna cover three areas today. The first section is gonna be around looking at how people are delivering delight at retail, how retailers and brands are creating destinations and experiences that truly deliver on shopper delight. The second area we're gonna be looking at is innovation and bold choices. Who's unlocking new possibilities in physical stores today? What's that look like and what's coming tomorrow? And then thirdly, taming the checkout challenge, how retailers are turning this universal pain point into a win. So let's begin with the first of these, delivering delight. How are retailers and brands creating destinations, experiences, and in-store impact that deliver shopper delight? And we're gonna turn it over to Joe Lampersius to begin that discussion. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> well, a good example is actually the coffee, uh, coffee category for uh, virtual retailers. It's actually a, a category that actually experiences a lot of interest, a lot of shoppability, 
uh, a lot of browsing. And, uh, you know, as you can see here, for just an example of one coffee aisle, um, it, it, it basically didn't bring a lot of emotion to the category. And uh, for one of the retailers and clients that we worked with first off was uh, Safeway, who was over-indexing to a coffee shopper, but under-indexing under sales to her, is we had to figure out how to bring emotion, excitement back to that category. And so seven years ago, we started embarked upon this effort with Starbucks. And Starbucks, knowing they have this great emotion that's in their Starbucks cafes, how do we bring that emotion into the store under our permanent end cap that leads you into the aisle to draw people into the coffee aisle? And through this reinvention, it's not just about Starbucks. It's actually increasing all the coffee activity. So the entire category gets a lift for the retailer. And you can see here through uh, another version as it started to hit other retailers. You can click the next slide. Uh, Amanda, um, and then and then also click the next slide is also thinking about how do we think about where the actual cafe itself when it does exist in a grocery store where should it exist? A lot of times it's just put on the fourth what's called the fourth wall, the entrance exit wall of the store. Uh, but with the fact that it actually draws so much aroma and emotion to the store, you know maybe it needs to be placed somewhat closer into the store to bring that emotion, and excitement, and aroma into the store. And, and nearer to the coffee aisle. Another uh, example is even a smaller footprint is when we, we work with brands to actually make end caps uh, in Target to be far more uh, exper experiential. Here you can see on the right with Nespresso where it's actually coffee machines bringing a super premium coffee maker uh, to Target and actually creating a permanent end cap that really elevates as you enter that coffee aisle in a more traditional kind of mainstream coffee machine aisle. And on the left you have, I'm sure a number of people have seen what they've done as they launched into the Target stores, is, is doing a big branded end cap to kind of set off that excitement of drawing you in to see something new, making it very simple, attractive, and draw you in from afar. Great. Thanks, Joe. I'll jump in here to further stress the importance of brick and mortar. So this is interesting. As of last year, half of digitally native brands also entered into brick and mortar. And I would say that's even more prevalent now given the situation. Um, in fact, Simpaco, we were really busy last year, right, Jack? Helping um, our clients that were D to C uh, with strategies on how to launch into retail and be successful there. So the next couple slides, we're gonna show you some examples. Um, and these are from Target. Target's kind of making a niche or a name for itself with bringing D2C personal brands uh, in store with great presence, usually exclusive and with exciting, engaging, and fun end caps. So on the left, you'll see Quip, um, which I would say uh, is doing to oral care what Carrie's did to men's shave. And on the right, you'll see uh, Wiki Lux, which is a fun new beauty brand. Um, so fun that people take pictures and post it on social media. So you know you're getting something right if you get on social media. Um, the next example is Function of Beauty. And this just launched over the holidays. Uh, and this is very interactive and fun. In fact, it has two steps. So the first step, you choose your foundation uh, for your hair care based on your hair type. And then secondly, you choose um, a pod or shot, as they call it, based on your individual hair goals. So I think the takeaway here for brands is that they can really partner with retailers to have fun, interactive, exciting um, in-store displays that are truly disruptive and inspire selling. Yeah, and I'll, I'll talk this one a little bit. The one myth about store design and brand presence within stores is it's expensive, it's complicated, it's hard to execute. Here's two examples that are pretty fundamental. They're not terribly expensive, but they obviously are leveraging some really critical brands. The one on the right, obviously, Barbie, which is all about dolls, and Lego, which is synonymous with putting things together that when you step on them, they also hurt your feet. <laughs> But at the end of the day, when you think about these, these are two executions that are, they just aren't terribly expensive, but they're terribly powerful. The one other thing that I would say about this, and I was gonna make this point earlier, Peter, 
when, uh, when Joe was talking about one of his examples, not only is the design work translating into delight for the shopper, but it's solving other problems. One of those executions also resulted in a 24% reduction in out stock because they designed in stock into the way they did the product. So there are multiple things that these kind of concepts can attack, um, which obviously is good for CPG and good for the retailer. Thanks, Jack. So as we, as we go forward, you know, at an even higher level, this collaboration that we're seeing between brands and retailers has also resulted in really remarkable success stories that have happened not just in the aisle or not just in an end cap, but really at the full department level. So we're going to take a look, look at some of the ways in which brands and retailers are partnering to re reimagine full departments. Joe, why don't you take that one? Yeah, if, you, if we go back in time, actually about a decade ago, if you walked into a Target, um, this is actually what the health and beauty and cosmetics section looked like, you know, 10, 11 years ago. And you can see, um, you know, still bright and, you know, red and Target-like, but not very inspirational, right? Just big price points on end caps. So it wasn't merchandise any different than Motorola. So what would inspire her to actually think about cosmetics and beauty inside Target when they actually over-indexed to that shopper, but they're highly under-indexing sales to her? Well, we went down this path with P&G and Target to actually say, what would that look like? Because they were losing sales to uh, Ulta and Sephora at the time. And if you think of those store environments that were actually very well lit, allowed you to try samples, gave you more room, gave you a little privacy, what would that environment look like in Target? So what was launched actually about uh, 10, 10, 9, 10 years ago was Destination Beauty 1.0 which you can see here is, is bringing a lot of inspiration, you know, pushing some aisles back, some forward, using concave shape to actually draw you into these, you know, uh, beautiful images of, of beauty. And then well-lit shelves and mirrors and actually areas for more sp space and breathing room so you can actually experience what the brand is about. And then going into Destination Beauty 2.0, which is the next slide, which we actually then start to bring additional learnings as far as how can we actually merchandise things that allow us to bring lower gondolas into in, almost in, interrupting the aisle. Uh, and then obviously now what's going into uh, 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 rollout across a number of stores for Target, as you saw in Brian, Brian Correll's video too, is the next version, which is Destination Beauty 3.0, which is now bringing the gondolas way down and creating sight lines across the entire beauty department to allow a female shopper to actually see almost upon her entire mission of looking for different things. So she didn't have to, you know, forget one aisle or the next, but could see how to map out her experience and try different things while she's in that beauty section. And the partnership in this, uh, just to make sure the, the audience is, is tied into that. Joe, Joe mentioned uh, P&G early on. Keep in mind, P&G, yes, they make Crest, but they also make Pantene, Olay, Aussie. So they were a category lead for this innovation and, and it was a, this close partnership that helped to bring it about. That's correct, Peter. Um, and then, you know, going into another example is uh, one that's uh, almost as big is when you think about the the, the a baby department in a mass merchandiser like Meyer. Um, this, this didn't look like this at first. Actually, in fact, if you shop baby clothing, baby clothing was in one section, baby food in another section, uh, diapers and wipes in a third section, and then strollers and other things and toys in, in a fourth section. And what we realized by studying the, the, the shopper and her behaviors inside of Meyer, working with P&G in this case, was is to bring it all together as one department where she could actually have a baby destination for everything and all her needs. So you, we brought basically clothing and diapers and food and strollers and toys all together in one department and shopped multiple aisles uh, you can click forward, Amanda, just to kind of click through these so you can kind of see. And this just had tremendous uplift, both for Meyer and all the brands. And you can see here, obviously, p g they only played in one, you know, one subcategory of the entire department. But it, bringing it all together is with the idea of bringing this experience where mom could actually stay and shop this entire section and slow down and look at different things. Uh, but in a sense, we sped her up because she didn't have to walk like 75 feet, you know, from one section to the next. It's all in one section. So as people allocate about the same amount of time they want to give to a section or a department of their list, if we give them some time back by actually putting things more conducive together, they can actually buy more and put more in the basket. 
Okay, Amanda, let's, thank you. So if we can, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about beauty. We've talked a little bit about baby. Let's shift the focus to consumables for a bit. The pandemic of 2020 has shifted nearly all consumption of food in the home. So food growth has been significant. So the, the key to that, though, is what are retailers doing now to sustain or even build on that growth? Jill, why don't you take that? Sure. Near and dear to my heart, food. So I would sum that up as food inspiration. That's what grocery retailers are doing uh, to sustain the eating at home. So obviously, as things get better and restaurants reopen and consumers return to outside dining experiences, the grocery retailers are going to be working harder than ever to retain that share of stomach. So they need to inspire uh, more at home dining and keep that trend going. And the best way to do that is, of course, with the perimeter of the store. There's so much you can do in center aisle, but you know the store comes to life in the fresh departments with produce, with meat, with bakery deli. Um, that's where you evoke the senses. That's where you inspire um, meals and recipes um, and eating at home. So of course, this is a picture of a beautiful produce section at Whole Foods. Um, we always said in merchandising, if you didn't get hungry when you came into a store, you weren't doing something right. So as you can see, that looks beautiful. It makes me hungry. Um, next slide, Amanda, is uh, we're going to see expansion of uh, upscale offerings and um, surprise and delight offerings in the perimeter of the store. And here, of course, you see uh, Murray's Cheese, which is a, a fine cheese from originally New York, of course, now owned by Kroger. Um, next slide, other brands will have an opportunity to play into um, the perimeter store and bringing this to life. Um, here you see Boar's Head um, with prepared deli meats and cheeses, and then McCormick, of course, with their spices. And next slide, um, we're going to continue to see the expansion of prepared foods, whether it's ready to eat, ready to heat, or take and make. Um, we're going to con continue to see grocery retailers fight for that food dollar. And they're going to bring local restaurants in store. Uh, create their own restaurant experience or expand um, their in-store dining experience with their bakery delis um, to uh, retain that, that food share. Um, this next example is um, a pilot that Kroger's doing with Cluster Truck. It used to be a fresh food delivery service, but now to bring people in store, they have two ghost kitchens, as they call it, where you can come in and order and uh, take your, um, your food home with you. Um, Next slide. So how do retailers and brands instill greater kitchen confidence? Well, this next um, example is what Kroger's doing. Like other grocery retailers, they have Home Shop, which is you know um, promoting in-home take and make with simple home cooking solutions and recipe meal inspirations. And on the next slide, you can see that retailers are also using technology to inspire in-home dining. Um, this is an example of uh, Kroger ChefBot, where people can take pictures of what's in their pantry or what's in their fridge and send it in via Twitter and get recipe or meal solutions that return back to them. So kind of fun. And of course, brands are doing their own solutions. And you see in this next slide, um, you know, tried and true Betty Crocker, has a recipe and meal solutions here. And then in the next slide, we have a Amy's brand, which is a frozen food brand, but you know they're showing you how you can add a little flair to the start of um, their products to make um, creative meal solutions. So I think the biggest takeaway for brands here is that consumers are visiting the retailer site now more than ever for these recipe or meal solutions and also to build their online shopping list. So brands need to play into the retailer site um, to get notice and to get play and attention there. Thanks, Joe. So there's something else that's going on right now too, and we're all aware of this, right? With the changing food preferences towards healthier, <clears throat> more holistic uh, approach to foods, there are whole new categories that are exploding. Um, Plant-based foods, certainly organics, CBDs I'm seeing increasingly, and of course, locally sourced foods, to name a few. This has really led to a proliferation of choices and options, which is making wayfinding an organization really challenging for shoppers. So, you know, the meat case, for example, 
plant-based proteins are growing at 38% in the past two years. And brands like Beyond Meat and Impossible are growing 150% since just, uh, uh, I think, 19, 2019, the last two years. So let's go to the next slide. In a category that's rapidly growing and evolving, literally each quarter, who's going to get it right? Do all plant-based meats go into their own dedicated section, quite separate from uh, animal proteins next to them? Go ahead to the next slide. Or does plant-based ground meat get shelved next to animal protein ground meat and so on? It means finding out from shoppers how they view the category and what makes intuitive sense to them. And it's work that's been done here. Um, and in fact, there has been uh, work done here by the, I think the, um, the plant-based uh, a trade group has looked at this. And, and it turns out that making the right choice here, one of these is in fact uh, the right choice, will drive an incremental 20% sales growth. Mm -hmm. And it was all about taking the shopper's view uh, into account to get it right. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground <clears throat> in this section. Let's jump into our next subject, all about innovation and imagination. What's required to unlock new possibilities in physical retail stores today and what's coming tomorrow? Jack, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Peter. Hey, I want to make one point. There was one question that came up in chat that I wanted to answer. It also is relevant to this one. The question came up when we were talking about design. How did it have an impact on improving in stock and so forth? One of the examples that is probably the best one is Starbucks, because not only did they give to the shopper the excitement and the energy, but they also loaded in more inventory, the right inventory. So the answer to a couple of people's question on that was getting the inventory right in the design of the planogram associated with that change is part of what uh, delivered that uh, improved in-stock condition. So thanks for the question. The, the, the thing I want to say here, obviously, we all are very, very aware of the growth of click and collect and so forth. And there's a couple of points I want to make. Number one, we've been talking about in stocks in the industry for longer than long. I had hair when we were talking about in stocks. And but the, there's a difference today. And the difference is. There's a shopper expectation, especially today, that I just don't have the time to wait. It's not safe. I really, really want my product when I want it. So the expectations of the shopper are as high as we've seen them at a time when retailer pressure points are as high as well. Labor, inventory pressure, and so forth. So we're in a perfect storm. And yet, when we think about all the design work that's taken place, if you think about some of those wonderful examples that the group just talked about, the base foundation is it's got to be in stock. And so one of the things we're seeing with Chasen and Fat and it's impactful is an incredible growth of CPG companies and retailers who are kind of accelerating their energy around uh, in stock. One of the drivers is what we call unknown volume, which, of course, is pickers. So if click and collect is grown and if click and collect is being sourced from the store, now all of a sudden you have a growing uncertain volume of demand that if it's not baked into the inventory model, the replenishment model, not only does that create an out of stock problem for the regular shopper, but it also creates an out of stock for the shopper who's buying online. So we're going to we anticipate we're going to continue to see a tremendous amount of energy in this area. And it's one of the reasons we continue to spend so much time on data solutions around availability, as well as literally work process analysis that starts to take a look at things like the the continued growth of click and collect. Jack, it's very foundational. Yeah, Jack, that reminds me of something that we're doing right now for a client. Uh, working in the retail space, dealing with this whole professional shopper versus the actual, you know, uh, normal shopper or these pickers and shoppers, whatever you want to call them, is the fact that through design, we're actually even looking at how to merchandise the category in a way that, you know, uh, where how, where does the picker pull from and where where does the shopper shop from, right? And so mm -hmm. the orchestration that we may lay out for pickers may actually be alphabetical. 
which sounds really weird because for shoppers that generally doesn't work when you orchestrate a shelf via alphabetical, but for pickers it does because they don't necessarily, it's not a passion category for the picker, right? They're just, they have a task. They got to find something quickly versus for the shopper, especially in beauty when they're looking for themselves, setting something alphabetically would be really odd, right? It really just wouldn't work. And so, but we're looking at that where maybe the top parts of the gondolas are actually meant for the shopper and the bottoms, which are in drawers or something, or whatever it may be, are alphabetical. So the shopper doesn't even need to see where the pickers, what the picker's doing. Yeah. Uh, so it's just, a, it's, a, it's an interesting way of thinking about because you've got two different behaviors. So we're trying to orchestrate and design in a way to create, cater to those human behaviors. Yeah, we're going to be publishing a paper on alternative fulfillment practices. And part of our point of view is we think that everybody needs to be very, very aware of the different programs that are out there. And then from a CPG company, think about what do I do differently as I work in this space? Because that uh, that train has left the station and is probably going to get <clears throat> bigger and larger and more unknown as time goes on. Yep. All right, Amanda, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> so one of the key areas of retail innovation today involves shopper personalization. And, you know, I can imagine that online fairly easily. I'm sure you all can. Uh, anytime I go to Amazon, they know exactly who I am and what I bought and recommend things, et cetera. They make it a very personalized experience. But how does that work in, at the store level? Um, let's go to the next slide. So we did a national shopper study early in 2020 to find out what shoppers think of retailers' applications, really when, when uh, COVID started taking off, and how they use them, what works well, and how they would rank, on, rank them on different metrics. Let's go to the next slide. And the apps that shoppers cited as being the ones that they like to use most are shown here. The larger the logo, the more frequently the app was mentioned. Target, Walmart, and Kroger were the most commonly used and, and all three rated very, very highly. Let's go to the next slide. Now, Target's app, uh, those of you who, who shop Target maybe won't be surprised, it scored the highest across the board on being the most useful and helping to make the in-store shopping experience simply better and easier than it would be without the app. Literally out of the mouths of the shoppers came, word, came words like, it enhances my shopping experience, my physical store shopping experience. They appreciated that it brought to life things like checking inventory, comparing prices, seeing if I can ship to home, checking coupons, locating items, using it at checkout, etc. It's a very, very helpful way that you take the physical environment and you make it more navigable and easier to get through just by bringing that app to it. Let's go to the next slide. Now, <clears throat> Walmart's uh, app now combines, you all know, their one separate grocery app and their walmart.com Walmart app into a single shopping application that's loaded with all kinds of functionality. If you have it, you know there's Walmart Pay, there's Store Maps, Price Checker, Item Finder, Prescription Refills. It goes on and on and on. But more importantly, the app has been developed in concert with the new design of Walmart's uh, new stores so that the app and the physical shopping experience are designed to work together for the shopper and really complement each other, like kind of what we just heard from the Target shopper. Let's go to the next slide. And so in the new store des designs that Walmart's got, and I think there are 200 on, on uh, supposed to be rolled out this year, the entryways, as you go in, encourage Walmart shoppers to open up their shopping app and make it integral, begin their shopping journey with the app in hand. Let's go to the next slide. And many of you have probably seen this. Their aisles are clearly defined by letter and number, a little bit like gates in an airport terminal. In fact, they, they said that was their inspiration. But there's greater use of icons to, to designate categories. And you can see that on top right there. It says women's apparel. It's a little bit difficult to see on the screen there, but there's a, there's a nice looking shirt there too to help uh, uh, see and say, make that a little bit more obvious. Let's go to the next slide. So shoppers who search for an item on the app, say you're looking for a blouse or something, they're directed to a specific aisle and the exact shelf location by letter and number. Search results use the same look as the wayfinding signage in store. So I'm sure blue figures prominently. Um, it helps shoppers to navigate more easily. 
but it will also, and we were talking about this early with, with Pat Pickers, it ought to help a picker move through the store much more easily and much more quickly. In fact, an awful lot of folks uh, in the industry believe that this redesign had pickers in mind when it was done. Decreased time spent looking um, will increase shopping satisfaction, certainly, but should also help drive bigger baskets since you know, if, if, if you're spending less time uh, frustrated and looking around for things, there's more opportunity to be inspired and discover uh, and, and make in incremental purchases. Next slide, please. Okay. A growing source of innovation at retail today are the partnerships retailers are creating, helping to drive better, more engaging shopping experiences. Now, these partnerships are springing up between different retailers and between brands and retailers. In all cases, the goal is one plus one is more than two. Let's look at a couple of these. Joe, why don't you start us off with uh, a look at Walgreens and Kroger? Yeah, I think the you know the the, the the two behemoths in the industry that everyone is trying to figure out how to compete against, right? Walmart and Amazon. And so what you're seeing here is a great uh, great effort. Where if you would have asked Kroger or Walgreens three, four, five years ago, would you ever you know get in the same footprint together? The answer probably would have been no. But what they're realizing, obviously Kroger has, you know, caught, uh, you know, somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 store locations. Walgreens has over 9,000, upwards of 10,000 store locations. And you think about if you're going to be the neighborhood grocery store, how do you actually help and work together to actually create a Kroger Express inside Walgreens? So I think it's a really ingenious idea where Kroger and Walgreens coming together uh, to really try to bring groceries quicker, closer uh, to the household, um, you know, because as post post COVID, I think we're going to see as as we saw a lot of people want to get back into stores. You know, Kroger wants to make sure they're actually in a sense a car's length away, uh, as Coke was always an arm length away from a Coke. So another example here is actually CVS and Target came together, and CVS and Target came together um, uh, because Target, you know, tar Target did a, a really valiant effort to being in the pharmacy business, but they realized like. It's just not our business. We're not competing. We're not the only to get people description. They're giving away fifty, hundred dollars trying to convert people. When they what they saw was they had a huge overlap between CBS and Target shoppers. So they said, wait a second, if we could put a CBS inside and create a partnership where they take over our pharmacy, maybe what we can do is actually ensure that we get her who goes to CBS versus some other store into our store and actually get her to increase basket and make the sale for us. So it's actually been a, a phenomenal partnership. But if you're in the OTC category of a manufacturer, now you got to start thinking about, okay, how do we play within that partnership, those partnership stores, and where is that located in the store to actually make sure I can drive that basket growth with this, this uh, new and flourishing partnership. Another two, two others that were just announced, which is interesting because we just talked about earlier, Destination Beauty on the 3.0 was really trying to get closer and closer to what Ulta was like, right, uh, while you're in Target. Well, lo and behold, <laughs> Ulta and Target coming together, where Ulta Beauty is going to go inside Target, and uh, because they too they felt, hey, we're just we're basically competing each other. What if we got together and Target said, look, at the end of the day, the success we had to put in CVS Pharmacy in our Target stores, what if we rather put Ulta Beauty inside of our Target stores, uh, not rather, but in addition, and now we can actually get her when she gets her prescription, she gets her beauty goods and everything else she needs from Target. So it's a great, I think it's gonna be a phenomenal partnership that you're gonna see flourishing. The other one here is uh, Sephora and Kohl's coming together, uh, which is, uh, Sephora was linked up with JC Penney, but obviously continue to not do that well. Kohl's con continues to do relatively well in that kind of old, I shouldn't say old, but more traditional department store format. Kohl's is the most progressive in that space. And I think Sephora saw that. So they actually have teamed up with Kohl's now to bring that Sephora experience inside Kohl's. Okay, so Joe, thank you for that. I think the, the, some really good examples there of where retailers are partnering together to create innovation that we, we otherwise would, wouldn't have imagined. Um, now let's shift things just a bit. Services versus things. So we've all heard this, right? That selling services versus things will need to take on increase, uh, increased focus. So what innovation have we seen in the delivery of new services at retail? Let's spend a couple of minutes of, uh, looking at what's happening today. Jack, why don't you start us off? Yeah, go to the next slide. Th this is really fascinating to us because 
whether services growth is shopper based or a different thing to do with the space within the four walls to make the asset prove out more. Obviously it's changing. Merchandising is shrinking, services are growing. We think that's gonna to continue to grow. So go to the next slide. Here's a couple of examples that we see that are kind of fascinating. Some of them we, you know, we all know we might have used the Geek Squad at Best Buy. When they first launched that, there were a lot of people scratching their head because they couldn't figure out the commercial value until they realized the more Geek Squad work that was going on, the more people were buying stuff from Best Buy because it the service took away their nightmares of trying to hook up all the cords, if you will. Go to the next slide. Um, staples, co-working, you know, think about office supplies and the change and what gets bought at, you know, online and so forth. So Staples starts to reinventing what services they provide, offices, shared offices, meeting rooms. Think about how synergistic those kind of services are with what people could buy as they get into a, a Staples store. Uh, go to the next slide. Obviously, Amazon and Kohl's, again, the question originally was, what is the value of Kohl's basically taking on this service? Well, it's called foot traffic. And then all of a sudden, when you get foot traffic for an alternative purpose, you hope that they, they stay, they buy, and the, the, the word is that they are getting their sales growth as a part of that partnership. And then Two items that really wouldn't necessarily match up, but they do is high V and orange, uh, orange you know, uh, workout space. So orange theory. So there's just all sorts of different dynamics where services, we think they're just going to continue to grow. It's going to be challenging for people to figure out the commercial value, but a lot of it's going to have to do with, with foot traffic and people buying and associated with foot traffic. And I think one of those commercial services that actually has popped up uh, all over the place recently is healthcare services. And, and, and we're going to see this, you know, more front and center than ever this year with the vaccines where all these retailers have committed to, you know, dispensing the COVID vaccine uh, to, to millions of shoppers. Um, and so I think the other thing is just because the aging population, it's, it's what retail has done is, is what we call the, the retailization of healthcare or democratization of healthcare. So it's more accessible to uh, millions of Americans uh, as we make this transition. And so the other thing is, it's just, it's just not about, you know, giving flu shots or vaccines or whatever. It's, uh, you know, the healthcare service is broader than just what you would think, where you can actually go there now for x-rays and physicals and, and uh, eye checkups and uh, ear ear checkups and, and so hearing you know hearing aids and all that stuff so it's amazing the amount of services and you've seen this pop up with walmart health on the next slide where walmart health has actually either attached itself to a walmart or actually even independent walmart health stores have launched uh where you can see here primary care counseling hearing dental labs x-rays optometry you know with you know fully staffed registered nurses uh, which with uh, with direct access to doctors <laughs> hospitals if, if necessary. Um, and then you can see also the transition for CVS of not just the minute clinics in a CVS, but also a complete reinvention of the health hub where it's providing, uh, you know, a number of additional services that minute clinic was just providing around kind of uh, sickness. But now there's also a lot of wellness services uh, uh, that are also available at the health hub. Uh, and then also Kroger with their success with the little clinics. Uh, Jill, I think what there's a couple hundred, couple hundred uh, little clinics. Four hundred twenty to be exact. Okay, yeah, cool. And it's and you know, but think about what's cool about the little clinic inside the food store. You know, Jill, why don't you speak to just even the transition of how it's health and wellness is not just defined about your physical being; it's about what you're putting in your body. So yeah, well. What, I mean, not only is Kroger providing healthcare services, but they're integrating it into what they do best, which is food. So um, we've all heard of the trend uh, food as medicine. Uh, that pretty much is, it's not about what you avoid, but it's about what you put in yourself, those positive attributes that improve your health condition, whether that's protein, um, probiotics, plant-based, 
um, immunity building um, ingredients. Uh, so this trend is only going to grow. And as you can see in the next slide, uh, grocery retailers are using dietitians to expand our play on uh, this trend as food as medicine. So uh, having dietitians in the store helping consumers is very uh, prevalent, especially now with genetic testing. Uh, they can help identify you, um, what you should eat uh, with your, uh, your current health conditions and improve your health goals. Um, this is especially popular with diabetics. So I think the, the takeaway here for brands is to partner with these retailers on their wellness program, right? And make sure that their products are featured and the special displays, uh, the special sections, the, the tags, or on a dietitian's list so that they're chosen as a, as a healthy choice. Thanks, Jill. Mm -hmm. So we're now going to try to shift into our third area of focus today, which is the checkout challenge. And maybe that seems like giving a third of our presentation to the checkout challenge might seem like overkill, but it's not. This is the number one pain point that shoppers cite. And by the way, it's a very expensive pain point uh, for retailers as well. So we want to take a look at how brands and retailers are turning this pain point into a win. And we'll start with Joe. Yeah, so um, next slide, Amanda. So everyone has probably experienced this, the self-checkout, maybe not at Walmart, but some self-checkout somewhere. Uh, but uh, th this was, uh, Walmart went down this path about seven, eight years ago, uh, as a number of other retailers did. What Walmart started to see quickly uh, was impulse sales dropped uh, pretty quickly, close to a billion dollars, upwards of almost $2 billion. And so working with Coke, what we did is we helped uh, Walmart try to figure this out. And what we did is we started to lay out a queuing, uh, a, a, in a sense, a line that could get people organized uh, because it was also, as you can see from that mess of the, uh, the photo before, it wasn't very organized that people know where to go and how to queue up. So we created this queuing up line, which is not a new idea. I mean, there's, there's retailers like TJ Maxx and Alta and others who queue people up for years. Uh, but one of the things we knew in the grocery, grocery store is that as the job now transitioned from a cashier to the individual where you're checking out your own stuff, you don't have a lot of free time. So even as you're waiting in the queue, you're kind of moving along because people are moving pretty quickly. We had to organize this very simply. And uh, as you can see, like, you know, uh, having different coolers for the brands that people buy because we know you're either a Coke drinker or a Pepsi drinker. So having branded coolers made it even quicker and faster to find your Coke product or your Pepsi product. Having snacks by sugary snacks and salty snacks, uh, and, and then snack, you know, kind of snack bars and things like that. So very simply organized, where it didn't get messed up merchandising wise. So the shopper didn't have to split, just think about a split second to pick up those items. So you can hit the next slide, Amanda, and then you can also see. So you see, there's actually in the store, kind of lined up, and then uh, also uh, 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 the next slide shows how this was done in Target. To also at right next to the checkout, so you could actually, as you're checking it out, you could actually put that confectionery, the, the gum, candy bar, whatever it is, or grab a bottle or a salty snack right next to it. The other thing that happened too is uh, uh, stores went to store pickup. People were, you know, buying it online but picking it up in store. You can see here in Target in 2019, this is was this was your typical pickup area, but then working with a confectionery client to help solve a problem because they're like, wait a second, if these customers are coming to your store, but they're not having a chance to buy anything, why don't we try to sell them some last impulse item? Item, And uh, you can see even like good retailers do, there's usually mom with the kid is that other picture. And so the candy's right in front of the children's face, say, mom, mom, I need these, put them in the bag. So, uh, so it's another chance to obviously get that sale uh, when they're just picking up item, increase that basket. Uh, the last is actually something that I'm sure a number of you guys have also experienced, which is actually uh, curbside. So, you know, as every retailer had to go to this model in, in 2019, uh, I'm sorry, 2020, is, uh, you know, there's a lot of, if you think about that queue time, if you've experienced this, sometimes it's actually perfect. You get there, you only have to wait three minutes. But sometimes it's five minutes, sometimes it's seven minutes or more. Well, what could we be doing as a retailer or in a, in a manufacturer working together to take advantage of that time? Could we create something within the Target app that knows they indicate they're here, but we can actually be looking at their list? Is there some artificial intelligence that actually could queue up uh, other relevant broad project of products they could be buying and adding to the list to make that last impulse uh, purchase? 
So let's go to the next one. Thanks, Joe. You know, as you think about checkout, it's also where many of the really tech forward solutions are appearing. Again, we're trying to turn what is a high friction point into a low friction point. So I'm going to ask Jack to help us understand how retailers are approaching this opportunity today and where it's going. And it is going almost science fiction. Yeah, project. thank you, Peter. It is certainly going science fiction. If, if you have not experienced Amazon Go, find a way to experience Amazon Go. It's probably the most forward thinking, frictionless checkout process you could imagine with stuff in carts. You put it in the cart, it registers, you take it out of the cart, it unregisters. And once you walk out of the store, it gives you a bill on your Amazon, uh, on your Amazon uh, account. Uh, the question is obviously with Amazon is going to be scale, but then you start taking a look at things like Walmart scan and go. Yeah, go to Walmart. Obviously, a, a concept, go to the next, there you go. You know, a concept where if you have the Walmart app, you can literally scan products as you go through your store. And when you get to the end, um, the phone gets scanned, you get billed off of the uh, card associated with Walmart's app, and you're done. So a lot of friction removed from that system. If you go to the next one, this is an example of what Meyer is doing, which is, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, I apologize. This is the one that really talks about, you know, helping you shop as you go through. It just shows the examples of how you scan the product and um, how you go through their process. Go to the next one. Uh, Myers called Shop and Scan, same concept. Uh, the thing that's fascinating, if you read about Meyer, they did this as a way to get shoppers to scan as they shopped. So they take the art of checkout and they move it forward in the shopping trip. So by the time they get to the end and the barcode gets scanned or the QR, QR code gets scanned, they still have a seamless way to get out of the store. The dynamic around these is to take friction out of the system. We need to think about constantly is that a good thing for growth of impulse? Is it a dynamic that we have to think about and think about differently? Okay, go to the next slide. Uh, grab and go, it, yet another version. It's a company that is relatively new. I think they're testing at Giant Eagle, but it's the same notion where you scan product on the phone app, the QR code gets scanned by the grab and go pedestal when they leave the store and they walk away and everything's complete. So, you know, you've got retailers doing their own, you've got third party companies doing theirs. The whole point to Peter's point is if, where there's science fiction taking place, it certainly is gonna continue to be at the checkout. And then if you go to the next slide, Walmart pickup towers. Uh, I think these started back in 2016, 2017. I think they started with about 700 and now I think they're up to 1500 stores. I don't know the exact number, but if you've not experienced these, they're kind of remarkable. And what they were trying to solve for was just to make it easier for shoppers who were buying online to go to one place, get their product and get out. It used to be that they had to walk to a particular location, maybe at the back of the store. The towers came along. And if you go online and you look at this, or if you've used this, you realize uh, you throw your order number or your code into the system off of your phone, and all of a sudden belts start to whirl, and the next thing you know, you have boxes that are what you bought online. They've even tested these with things as large as TVs. So these are gonna continue to grow uh, within um, within Walmart. And then the next one is the Amazon Dash Cart. Basically, anything going into the cart that it reads shows up on the screen, automates checkout, same concept except it's read off the cart instead of the ceiling. Go to the next slide. This one is amazing. This one is truly amazing. It's called... Uh, it's a, it's literally an automated cart. And I, Peter, do we have a video of this? We do. This is in Beijing, China. Let's just watch the video. Yeah. If it'll play. 
basically you pick up a you pick up a wristband, right? That's Bluetooth to the it's Bluetooth to the cart, so the cart follows you around the store because the video is not playing that great. Um, but it also has obviously you can uh, there's there's a technology on the the cart too that you can um, scan things, check things. So it's 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 also contains self checkout. So. so now all of a sudden, not only have they removed the checkout part of it, they've facilitated the shopping part of it. Um, and then Amazon One, which is basically in non-scientific terms, a technology that will read your palm, will identify you, think about the consequence of this as it relates to uh, pharmaceuticals, anything that you buy, you know, the way to ease identifying you in the checkout process. So a lot of things that are going to take friction certainly out of the system. Yeah, I think also, Jack, it applies to alcoholic beverages that have check IDs and all that stuff. So yeah. anything that has to verify that it's you and your age verified and it's you. So a lot of opportunity here that's coming. Yep. Thanks, Jack. So that brings us back to where we began our discussion today. As we collectively face the challenge of how to activate at physical stores, we've shared areas where we think <clears throat> there are brands and retailers are creating real success stories in the areas of delivering shopping delight, driving innovation and bold choices, and overcoming the checkout challenge. Hopefully you've come away feeling energized and maybe inspired to take a fresh approach to how your organization looks at activating physical retail today. We've covered a lot, and what we'd like to do is boil that down to just six key takeaways for you. Let's go to the first, thank you. <clears throat> so physical stores remain at the core of shopping. As we heard Brian Cornell say, stores are at the very center of our strategy to win. Um, and it's worked brilliantly for, for uh, Target. The notion of making the store the hub of the shopping experience is really at, at the heart of that. Still, you know, 90% of all purchases happen in physical stores. But the store itself, at least the way Target views it, and I believe Walmart's taking the same approach, most of the online purchases people go to the store to pick it up. They don't want to wait the day. They don't want to, they don't want to pay the delivery fee. And they'll either go in store or, do, or, or they will do curbside. The rest of the, the online purchases are delivered to home. Those are the minority. And again, in the case of, of, of Target, they own Shift that sends it there. So making the store very much of a hub uh, for commerce has worked very well for, for Target. And I believe it's a model that will work elsewhere. Secondly, buying convenience and shopping delight must coexist. I mean, if you think about it, delivering on transactions without delivering on inspiration is what a vending machine does. However, that said, transactional requirements, being able to check in, check out, having e-commerce, uh, all of that stuff that, that makes that, that takes out those points of friction, it's table stakes. You've got to do it. If you're not doing it, your competitor is. So yeah, you, you got to do that. But if you really want to get it right, we think the right commerce cocktail is one part physical, two parts digital. Think about that, the Walmart store design that's built to work seamlessly with their app or Target's app that makes the shopping experience easier and better. Is there a role for augmented reality in some areas of the store? We've done that with uh, client iRobot to help bring to life demonstrations for $650 uh, uh, item to purchase a, a robotic vacuum. You want to see how that worked before you take it home. And what, what's the role of smart speakers in shopping in a store? There's so many places where digital can help enhance the physical space. Okay, three, delivering delight can be easier as a shared endeavor. So that happens on two levels, right? Uh, retailers and brands, and we saw that at a category level, Starbucks, Signature Isle, Boar's Head, even McCormick has done a phenomenal job bringing the equities of their brand uh, to the spices aisle. And at a full department level, we saw Target and P&G Beauty, but then retailers joining force with other retailers, uh, Target and Ulta, Kohl's and Sephora, Walgreens and Kroger, there are opportunities where, again, that one plus one can equal more than, more than just, we see lots of, uh, we see more of that ahead. And then the fourth thing that, that we took away from this was that fast growth categories, and they are popping up every day, are really ripe for reinvention. Uh, Plant-based products, CBDs, organics. Uh, I mean, it, it's some time ago, really the dairy category led this with plant-based products, but there's cashew milk, there's pea milk, there's rice milk, there's soy milk and yogurt and butter. And it really is a, a cacophony of visuals. And I don't know that people have done the work, retailers and brands, 
to simplify that, to understand through the shopper's eyes how they view the choices. Don't think about this from a scanner-based approach. Ask, ask a shopper to sit down and sort some cards and figure out how do they look at the category? How do they define it? Let's go to the next slide. Five of our sales. Move beyond selling things to providing solutions. Honestly, we didn't talk about it in here, um, but pet retailers have been doing this for years. Pet retailers grew up selling 20 bags of, of 20 pound bags full of dried dog food and, and uh, cans and dogs of, of cat and dog food and litter. And they quickly learned that selling stuff was very limiting. And in fact, having dog adoption events and, and puppy training and pet hotels and grooming and dog sitting, all of those services created a massive way of not only inc increasing their revenues, but their connectivity and relevance to their customers. The real opportunity for that. So think about the services you can bring your shoppers. We saw Staples doing that with, with uh, co-working in their stores. It's brilliant. It's obvious once it's been done, but it's brilliant. Kohl's partnering for, with Amazon for returns. That was a very gutsy thing for them to do. I, I'm an Amazon junkie, and I go to Kohl's all the time for all my returns. I never spent a nickel at Kohl's until three years ago when I started going there for returns. They get a lot of my share of wallet right now as it relates to department stores. Uh, REI, by the way, they have a complete outdoor uh, adventure trips offering now. They used to just sell stuff, tents, bikes. Now they sell you the trips to go use that stuff. So is there a service area that will enhance your brand? It's worth thinking about. Um, and then the last thing we wanted to say is that new growth opportunities may be hidden in plain sight. So there were a couple of questions about this while we were going through these things. Joe talked about curbside pickup at Target, but fill in the blank, curbside pickup at XYZ retailer. There is easily 5, 10, 15 minutes dwell time there. You're sitting around waiting. That could be at the counter in the store or at curbside. What are you going to do with that time if you're a brand and a retailer, particularly if you're in the area of Impulse? If you're an Impulse brand, CSD, salty snack, confection, you should definitely be talking to your retail partners about how do you find a way to drive incremental revenues there. Um, and then the growth at home cooking, that really could be an opportunity for those who are food retailers to expand your food repertoire. What about ghost kitchens for restaurant quality food from your store? Or creating in-store dining options like we saw Hy-Vee do and we know Wegmans does. New opportunities, the point here, are really in plain sight and they're coming faster than before. So you just need a fresh set of eyes, which leads me to my final thought. Next slide, in case that wasn't <laughs> obvious. The final thought is this. There's a remarkable time of fast-paced change that we're living in right now. It's really hard for any one person or one organization to have all the expertise and all the answers that you need to win today. You can benefit from an outside perspective. Tap the experience from people who've worked across other brands, other retailers, um, and people who are used to keeping the shopper at the center of, of, of your choices. I think we're all drowning in what data? I'm sure people on the, on the line can relate to that. More SKUs per square inch per square second. We are drowning in what data? Find people who, help, who can help you figure out the why. One more slide, please. So that's our presentation for the day. Click again if you would, Amanda. There you go. Um, and if you'd like a copy of it, or if you'd like to have a further conversation, please email myself or Jack Buller, and we will gladly send you a copy or have a further conversation or answer any of your further questions. With the time that remains, if there are some additional questions that come through, um, we'll gladly jump on them. Jack, why don't you talk to us for a second? Somebody had asked about the fact that we've gone from the split of not too much service, boatloads of merchandise, and I got a warehouse somewhere in the back to this new model where it's almost a third, a third, a third. Yeah, yeah. Sean had asked that question. You know, the notion is, you know, we continue to see services growing. With some retailers, services has grown as a way to grow the business. With some retailers, services have grown as a way to rethink what they do with the physical store and inventory. I don't think we concern ourselves too much with the why, but the what is creating consequences. And so as merchandising starts to get reduced, I think it's incumbent upon us to think about how do we make sure that we're getting our share of that merchandising that's right, that's good for the retailer and good for the manufacturer? And at the same time, to the point that Jill and you made, Peter, how do we think about inserting our brands into some of these services? Because services don't need to be uniquely created only by the retailer. 
they need to be in a lot of cases a joint venture between the retailer and the and the manufacturer right and then of course yep. warehouse and offline or online is kind of self-explanatory as click and click grows more space is going to be devoted depending upon how they do it if they can streamline it ideally they would want to make the orange actually shrink down but get the same output and then devote some of that space back to services and manufacturing and merchandising. Right. Yeah, and so in some yeah. cases, uh, like the uh, in Target in big suburbia, where Target has actually taken over even larger footprints. So their merchandise hasn't. Uh, it, they are doing the three areas, but uh, the stores actually they went to a bigger format store because they actually like the beauty section we shared actually is twice the size of what it is in a normal store. Uh, but it was an interesting comment by Brian, uh, as he, he talked about, he thinks their biggest growth is that smaller urban format store that they're launching. They've tested in a lot of college towns, um, and they're actually launching it in a lot of other urban formats now, too, which I'm not sure if that how that how that lays out when it comes to services, merchandise, or warehouse online fulfillment. My guess it's it's probably more traditional around just a very small format merchandise store around, you know, consumables, because it's right on, usually attached to most college campuses where they started and back to school. Right. Yeah, well, so the biggest, I think the biggest driver of this, well, two big drivers, one is the importance of services, we've talked about that, but also the fact that you know, a growing portion of purchases are online and picked up at stores. So it's not that this product needs to be on shelf per se, it needs to be in the warehouse or fulfillment area. And the dedicated the space you dedicate for for merchandise on floor can be dialed back and, and reality. Yeah, Larry Larry makes a good point actually. He's, every inch of the visit the store is important. Target, Walmart, others now taking over what traditional department stores were doing for so many years. Think about that. What what the department store was was to be like a almost a mini mall in itself to provide all right. these categories and departments and services. Uh, but unfortunately, most of them just didn't stay contemporary, right? Um, and, and do it in a way that now. Now it's kind of coming full circle where, you know, these, these stores are becoming, in a sense, little mini malls under themselves again. Hey, All right. Peter, one other thing that I would mention real quickly, and that is, and I think everybody needs to think about this, and that is the impact of all this on assortment. Mary Meeker made the point about smaller footprints. Obviously, it makes a lot of sense. With COVID, with online, with the reduction of footprints, assortment is just going to be under assault. And so it's going to be incumbent on CPG companies and retailers to think about how do we redefine what that optimum looks like, which to me creates a great opportunity for companies like Chase as they really, really have that expertise to design within whatever that assortment would be. The assortment may not be as critical. It is the ease of which people can shop through it. So it's going to be a force that's probably not going to be reduced, but will probably grow. Yeah. So I'm going to um, close it there. It's just about 20 past the hour. Thanks, everybody, again, for joining us. And for those who stuck around for this additional dialogue, we're, again, thanks. Um, one moment, uh, Matt, if you go to the very last slide one more time, the final point I will remake is um, we're glad to make a copy of this available to you. Just email to um, the the... Uh, well, he's going to come up slowly. Uh, email myself or email Jack Buller. Um, we're getting there. <laughs> close. We're getting there. We are so close to the emails. There they are. Take a screenshot of that if you would, and we'll gladly get you this. We'll, we're available for questions, answers, whatever will work for you. Again, my thanks, everybody. Best for the rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.